live with this project and it has been for many other people so hey all, all for like i'm all all for uh taking everybody's debut and virginity in the instagram live <laughs> um you look you look fabulous like you look more more cooler than i am it's like i'm here in basking in the sun very very hot um so my room i don't know if the light is the best i'm just using the natural light um well natural yeah. light is the best light i'm using natural yeah. light you look Stunning as always. Um, what was the way for people to uh, tune in? Um, everybody, um, welcome to the 16th episode of Morse Calls by Vesa. And uh, I have an amazing, amazing uh, guest, Miss Alejandra Munoz, a designer that I, I actually um, was honored to meet for the first time doing a um, video link with Harvard um, no. Showroom and Valeria Alexandrova, who is representing um, Alejandra. So, and now I'm uh, blessed to have you here. So everybody, if you have any questions throughout the, the talk, please use the question box. Throw any type of questions you uh, want to ask me uh, or Alejandra. So I'm going to get to that at the end of the show. But now I can see that people are tuning in. Could you please tell everyone who are you, what you do, and where are you Morse coding to us today? Yeah, um, I'm Alejandra Muñoz. Um, I'm 25 years old. I'm from Barcelona. And uh, I'm a fashion designer. Um, I moved to London seven years ago now. I think it's been a while, yeah. I moved here wow. when I was 18 to start studying uh, fashion in Sandra St. Martins. And I just graduated last year. I think actually yesterday I was, uh, I was reminding remembering that it was the one year mark from the fashion show that we did last year for the graduation. Um, so yeah, so it's been a year, really nice year. I'm, uh, you got right lucky. Now, you got lucky, you got a show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's not, it's not always the case in CSM. There's always a bit of a scrutiny. There's always, uh, they always choose, I think, 30 designers from 120 to do the, the show, oh, the wow. press. And I was quite lucky. Uh, to be able to be, be part of it so that was really good and since then i've been uh, working with 100 showroom i'm part of their uh well part of their design team i guess i have my i'm starting my own brand at the moment so yeah seeing how that goes um i also intern i intern for aris van herpen and paloma spain um which i, I think is yeah I, I, rem I remember him from london when he was studying here we used to go yeah. to the same bars. The, the, the biggest yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I interned with Palermo Spain for four months uh, for the first show that they did in Paris, uh, the, uh, the official, first official show in Paris presenting in the schedule. And then I interned for Iris Van Herpen doing one of their couture shows in summer. Um, really beautiful collection. We went to Paris as well to present it. A lot of handwork, uh, really, really detailed, you know, a lot of, yeah, yeah a lot of really specific techniques that she de developed. So that was, that was great. And now I'm, um, yeah, starting with my own brand. Well, now we're in the coronavirus situation, <laughs> but <laughs> apart from that, <laughs> I was yeah, working. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people are, are starting a lot of things, right? Like it's, it's, it's the most weirdest things have been trending since this, uh, this virus hit the fan that what I've noticed from like people that I follow so I'm just like some some of them are all great some of them are like not so good um but I guess, <laughs> I guess it's part of the process um that sounds amazing it's like um uh like I said like Paloma is one of the biggest sweethearts like but I I met him after many many years uh last time when I was in Madrid I was actually in a club and I was like do you remember me it's like 
you've become so huge and it was like of course like this was like the the days when we both moved to London back in the day like almost a decade ago and then uh Iris van Herpen is obviously um industry juggernaut I've worked with a yeah, it's, it's like one of, the, one of the one of the big ones for sure but it's funny yeah. with Palo because um I moved to the south of Spain to work with him in this really small atelier that he has there in Cordoba uh, and yeah. so I love this, this contrast that he has that he represents such a queer such a such a cosmopolitan uh, aesthetic but then the whole collection is produced still in a really you know low scale and she works with the she works with the seamstress that she has met for years i think that you know like childhood friends from like his small village so it's quite interesting the whole energy they create in the studio because you know sometimes we have you know great uh, famous people come to the studio but then all the seamstresses they don't even know how to speak english it's like such a yeah. good such a cool yeah i mean i love that yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's and that's really nice that he he has been uh, continuing the sort of like craftsmanship uh, tradition that seems to be disappearing from my industry. Hopefully, yeah. getting now another boost and with the sort of slow pace. But how has this um, lockdown been for you? Like, you obviously you are you are also stuck in London, so to speak, like yeah. like I am. Um, how has it been for you? both like professionally and mentally. Yeah. It's been a mix. It's been a mix. I was lucky enough to be involved in a project uh, when this lockdown started. So, uh to be honest, I've been pretty busy until two weeks until the last the last two weeks haven't been as busy. But I was um I was doing some lectures for a university in India, fashion re- uh, regarding fashion lectures, and that was quite fun. It was a new project that I embarked myself into. But to be honest, yeah, it has been Uh, it has been too much, too much time, too much time in my hands, and obviously I've been. I'm lucky. I'm lucky enough to share my household with great uh, friends of mine, and you know we have a lot of fun, and, it, and it's a lovely environment. But still, like it, it has got to me. Um, I'm a person that is quite emotional, that is quite sensitive. So not being able to see my friends, not being able to to congregate in you know in nightlife, for example, or yeah. any other. Type of, event um is a big it has been a big struggle for me to be honest and both uh, personally and even for you know when it comes to my brand as well it's been quite limiting because i don't have i barely i have been i had a certain amount of fabrics that i could work with uh, that i had already purchased that i had quite like a leftover of them but i ran out of fabrics as well so there wasn't that much that i could you know work on it's, it's been a strange time it's been a strange time like block into this strange period into this room yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's definitely like um i've 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 been lucky enough since i like made myself really busy with with the more scots that has now started a life of its own which it which is great mm-hmm. because otherwise i would have been like jumping against the walls like going crazy like what the hell am i going <laughs> to do so, you know because because i am i've always been a person that i like to do things you know i'm like um you know like a sponge like i i like to do things i like to see things progress and at times I'm, i can be very impatient as well so it's definitely given me a lot of structure which is great and for, this is a perfect way to talk to new people I, like i've met so many amazing people all over the world that i had didn't even know existed and now they are like very close friends of mine and i talk with them on the daily on whatsapp which is crazy i would like phone calls and so what now so it's truly been a blessing in that sense but yeah i am ready for this goddamn yeah. thing to, to at least like to open the door a little a little bit for me um, to yeah. to go out and have a giggle or, or a little bit in my life um what okay, are, like sorry i think like because i'm a person that i'm quite involved in and my life as well um i love yeah. dressing up i love making clothing uh, you know do crazy makeup and go out and meet all my friends and i feel that's been obviously that hasn't happened for a while as well and i'm used to maybe like once a week get a, get get all together and have a moment and it's been it's, it's been pretty lonely to be honest it's quite yeah. interesting because we've reached this kind of like dystopian future <laughs> situation in which we only communicate through screens through phones like social media has become i mean everything that we have to communicate with other people for many of us um 
you know, Skype calls or Zoom calls, and it's, it's all about the, the screen. So it's been a really, yeah, a strange period. <laughs> Very, you know, but, but to be honest, like I've never, you know, I, I think it's been a great aid for me to achieve a lot of things. But if, if I'm completely honest, I've never been a massive fan of social media because I, I like to, I like to talk to people. I like to, I like to, uh, vibe i like to see the the people's charisma when they walk into a space and it's all about that to me as well so it's not it's not about who is wearing the the best designers it's about how people wear stuff and to be honest like this is very limiting for a full look i'm six foot four <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I can, you know fit myself into it so it's like it, it really um is doing my head in. and to be honest as resourceful as we can be how much can you do with like a, a certain amount of square meters, a couple of things, nothing new is coming in from the doors yeah. or the, unless you're going on a crazy shopping spree. Yeah. Uh, how, what are your thoughts now? Because it's like, uh, obviously for people who are not in London, we we have a very weird situation here. Like our, our prime minister is saying like, go to the parks, do this. And it's, yeah. it's been all over the place. What is your what is your take on like do you feel comfortable just like now going out in the parks and and so what? Um, I've been trying to keep. I'm really lucky that I live next to a uh, big uh, well the Hackney Marshes. They're literally yeah. next door. To me. Like I can see them through the window. So I'm really lucky in that sense because I'm able to go outside and actually not encounter many people. Regardless, for example, today when I went outside for a second and they're so busy like. <laughs> People are not taking it that seriously. And um, it's funny because, yeah. uh, well, I'm from Barcelona and in Barcelona and in Spain, this whole situation has uh, escalated. I mean, we have, I think in the UK, we have the same amount of of deaths and, and it's been as, as serious as in Spain. But in Spain, they have approached in a much more, um, well, in a more serious way, I guess. And they have had a much more strict lockdown. And my parents, my parents hadn't been able to go outside until... I think this week, so it's been really strict. They couldn't even go for a run or anything like that. It's been full on lockdown. But yeah. here, I think in comparison, it hasn't been as intense. So, yeah, I mean, it's important to be careful. It's important to be mindful and careful. I'm lucky that I'm, I don't, well, everyone that lives in my house, we're all under 30. So um, we don't have anyone in a situation of, in, of, you know, in risk. We don't have anyone that has any underlying conditions. So. In all, all in all, we're quite safe. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just um, it, more than anything. It just worries me in terms of you know my parents. They're fifty. My grandparents are, you know, eighty, eighty-three. Is is more concerning. Uh, you, you know, when I think about them. But yeah, so far as well, <laughs> such a far distance. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I and I think like the whole thing is um, what I keep on telling to all my friends that you know don't compare countries to each other because. It, we are all culturally different. Our social uh, behavior is different. You know, now people are like saying, uh, but, uh, but, you know, Scandinavia and Sweden is doing this. And it's like Sweden is a completely different thing than the UK. Yeah. Plus, plus, you know, I can say like, I come from Finland. I'm, I'm going to tell you the, to do different things. The public transport in Scandinavia versus the public transport in London, UK is like Mars and Venus. You know, it's like the, the way it's built is completely different. In Finland, you know, giving two meter space to the other pedestrian is considered normal. It's called personal space. Here, that yeah. is called uh, social distancing. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so to me, yeah, those two things are like completely yeah. two different things. Um, enough of the the you know just like being a debbie downer and talk about coronavirus um i would like to hear about your design aesthetic you know because i've i've, I've seen i've been lucky enough i've seen your designs up to up and close in uh 100 showrooms i've yet not to uh got to play with it but if you could tell about like that the whole design ethos behind it what is the what is the the fire that drives you behind all of it yeah, I feel for me, um, there's definitely a passion in silhouette. That's my main, my main obsession is achieving. I feel like uh, because, uh, well, I'm a trans woman and I have grown uh, being really self-aware and being really aware in general uh, when it comes to 
clothing and how they play a massive role in society, how we gender, you know, depending on the clothing, we gender people and how it completely changed the perception of who you are, depending on what you're wearing. So I find that really interesting. And I think you can get the most out of it when you play with silhouette in that aspect. So by transforming the clothing, by the way you drape the clothing, or even by the way you constrict the, the body with the clothing, you can achieve completely different visual uh, aesthetics and even, you know, visual you know, perception of, of the gender. And I think that's the thing that I think is the most interesting. Um, that said, it can be applied to anything, you know. Um, I think I, I really, I find really interesting the silhouette. But then again, I have worked with brand a lot, which I really enjoy. Um, so I really like the wow factor, I guess, <laughs> still. is, is the fact yeah, is the fact the most interesting. And yeah, and how and how the visuals play with people's perception of who you are. And that's the most fun part of everything, right? And that's yeah. how I approach all my collections. I always like I always like working with a muse. So I start much more I feel like a lot of my collections start with an emotion, with a feeling that I keep uh, you know, researching on, and I, I keep building this persona um, that I develop for for a collection, like a mood board, right? Like like a mood, like a character. Right? It goes quite deep. I, I like I like my fashion not to just be uh, beautiful or just to be effective when it comes to visuals, but I love building a story behind it. Like I like telling the story of a person or or a movement or or something that I think it might happen in the future that I think is interesting and beautiful. So I like digging in and trying to give meaning to the clothing, you know. I think that's my my favorite part. It's not just creating beautiful clothing, but try to explain something with them. Try to give, you know, tr yeah, transfer emotions or information or uh, a state of being or something like that. That's my favorite part for sure. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's, it's all about the substance and I believe especially now since our society is kind of like forced to uh you know go through this type of evolution of you know find a meaning and find a reason for things and we can't just like aim let like be like headless chickens running after the like you know materia you know without any type of reason or taking any type of responsibility of any of the type of actions that we do like what whatever that is whether it's buying whether it's how you treat other people in your close society your friends yeah. family whatever how you even treat yourself for whatnot so i, I believe it's, it's it's a very very important thing and uh, for for many uh if, if you didn't clock clock it already but alejandra is wearing one of her own <laughs> That I know the backstory, but would you want to tell the backstory of yeah. uh, the people? Uh, yes, yeah. this earring is from my from my graduate collection. I don't. I think I can show you a bit closer, and you can maybe get it. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. I mean, it's perplex that is laser cut, and each is like a flower, obviously. Uh, but each petal represents uh, the body of a trans woman. So as you can see, there the the thighs the thighs and then the penis in the middle. And when you join them all together, you can create the flower. Um, obviously, this is a quite big scale, but my whole idea with this collection was uh, representing bodies like mine, so trans bodies, in a way that wasn't necessarily as obvious. And there were, I was still producing beautiful pieces, right? But, but there were still, in a way, my small protests, my, my small, you know, something to say about the topic. You know, trans bodies for me are stunning. They're beautiful and they're not any less you know feminine or ballad and i think in a way that's you know the cheesy part of like making a flower out of it but i think it's a quite a quite cool a quite cool way of approaching the topic you know it's subtle it's, it's something that my mom could wear if it was in a smaller scale let's say for example there's nothing that yeah. crazy of but i love but adding I that I, I even see that as something that you can you know use as a as a very um like a signature that that can be translated into yeah fabric as in laser print can be like mm -hmm. you know incorporated to a lot of things so it doesn't have to be just a earring that's how i it, see it i i think it's, it's it's almost like a concept that can you know build up to be a full collection around just a simple concept like that and i think it's beautiful and you are absolutely right on the fact that um you know trans bodies and all types of bodies in general are beautiful yeah. i don't I don't really understand this like yeah, how, how, I think I think yeah sorry go ahead go ahead no like that I don't understand this type of like weird way of thinking that it seems to be in certain type of like um 
social groups, just only one type of body is acceptable. And that goes across the board. You know, it's almost yeah. like it's, it's not only on on trans, it's on uh, heteronormative groups, it's in gay groups. That, that there's this weird type of like thing, how you should supposed to look like, when the best part is that we none of us look the same. <laughs> That's the best part. Yeah, and I think it's just all, everything it comes down to, in my opinion, just a lack of visibility, a lack of representation and a lack of exposure. So when it comes to the trans bodies, for example, is what we were discussing uh, um, in the other talk um, that I was just saying, uh, the only chance that you have to get exposed to a trans woman body nowadays is quite possibly only through porn. There's, there's no, you know, there's no TV series, uh, you know, let's say glamorizing or at least just speaking or showing you a trans woman body. The only access you have is through, you know, yeah, exactly as I said, porn. So my whole concept with that is just visualizing it in a way that wasn't necessarily associated with something that you do, you know, behind closed doors, that is something to celebrate. And I think that can come to any type of body that is not, that doesn't fit exactly with the representations that we get into the media. I think where, where we're lacking most of anything, it's just information. Um, it's the, whole, the same conversation as when we say that education is so important. Why education is so important is because it, it puts a light into an aspect of something that we don't understand and we don't know. And by learning that, we become famili familiarized uh, with the topic, right? And we start we stop fearing it. And I thought I, I think a lot of hate that comes towards trans people or any other community, any other minority, it comes from that lack of information and that lack of knowledge. And that lack of knowledge generates fear yeah. um, at the end of the day. And I think that's the way it was sorting it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not necessarily like it's just showing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because I think it's it's the problem is that everything that is seems to be different is it's been through the like the core problem of humanity it's like what you don't know scares you is afraid it's like even though it would be a better option you would say don't keep on drinking that poison because it's going to kill you yeah. have this one instead no but i don't know what it is i'm going to stick to this shit yeah. that i'm used to it's it's almost that sort of weird brainwashed the way that the society likes to think as in as in a group rather than an individual and to be honest the, if if all of these type of things that keep keep on constantly being uh, swept under the rugs it would be on a normal conversation people would really they would be like ah oh, you are trans oh that's great you know i really like your hair color you know this is how it, it's going to become <laughs> as a very average and casual context like it should be. It's like my mom always taught me that Besa, it doesn't matter what X, Y, or Z does in their bedroom, in their private time. If you like the person, that's all you need to know. The rest is none of your business. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it should be. And it goes through the lens that you look at things. You know, yeah. if you have only a certain group of friends, maybe they're, they're going to perceive something as you know, as something that maybe is a bit ridiculous or a laughing matter or whatever. And then you only see, when you only discuss that topic, you only see it through that lens of, you know, the, the humor lens. But then when you meet other people that actually find that aspect much more serious or interesting, then it changes the lens in which you perceive, you know, whatever topic you're discussing with. And this comes to, again, trans bodies. You know, if you only hang with certain types of people, it's always going to be the joke, you know. But then when you actually yeah. meet maybe trans people and you realize that they just you know, do the same normal things that you do and, you know, and it's not such a big deal, to be honest, to, you know, yeah. have this life with genitals, like it's not that deep. Then you realize that it makes you feel a bit ridiculous that you're, you know, that you're taking it so, like as such a important, serious thing. I mean, that even happened to me. That even happened to me when I, when I started transitioning when I was 16, I was that girl that I never wanted to, to come out. That I, I I thought I was going to live a stealth life as a woman, that I wasn't going to admit my transness, at least at least if I got caught. But when I moved to London, um, when I was 18, um, I started meeting all this diverse group of people, that, you know, ranged from like straight people to more open-minded straight people, to bisexuals, to gay men, to drag queens, to uh, gender non-binary uh, individuals. So there was such a big array, such a big... Uh, such a big group, such a diverse group that I didn't even know many of, of those different identities. And it really is so nurturing because 
learning of so many different identities made me perceive myself completely different. Same. Same. Fully different. I, I, in, in the beginning, same. yeah. Same. Yeah, in the beginning, I was so obsessed with being like the most feminine, you know, always trying to hide my voice, always trying to do all these things. And it was like that obsession for representing that women that, that you know, that I thought I wanted to be. But then when you meet all these other diverse group of people, you actually start caring less. And now I don't do many of the things that I did before. Now I speak with my normal voice. Now I'm not ashamed of, of you know, telling people that I'm a trans woman and, and having discussions about it. I actually think it's really important because it's just the same way that it helped me meeting all those people. It, it could help other people meeting me, you know, and, and really think that for me, it's not a big deal at all. The fact that, yeah, that I was born trans. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, 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 I'm a hundred percent with you. Like I've been in London for, for a decade and I remember coming here. I was so naive. I thought I, I had, I, I remember feeling that I had it all together and I've all figured it out and yada yada yada. Yeah. So I was 25 when I moved here. Uh, yeah. 10 years, I can't believe it. Um, and, <laughs> now, and now I keep on saying to like, it was, I, was, uh, I was a lot more uh, feminine when I moved to London because I had uh -huh. this type of like idea, like coming from like a smaller community where you can still express yourself, but it was very one dimensional. You yeah. know that the gay people in Finland back in the day, they were not really masculine in the sort of a uh, commercial context so if you would see like the sort of masculine game and that would be in a very sort of you know back alley you know more fetish kind of very very non non-happening scene and then now I feel like like coming to london that and being exposed to a lot of things i feel like that it made me the like actually made me the man that i am that i kind of found found the person that i am and, and then certain like elements kind of like toned down into their own places and then yep. to kind of give, give comfort. And then, the diversity, yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. and for you to realize that you can be all of that, but you don't have to be it all, of, all at the same time. You can be on one day and it's like, fuck it, I just want to wear that. And yeah. then another day yeah. I'm gonna like, yeah, I'm gonna put my six inch stilettos on and I'm yeah. gonna go and prance around in Soho, but it still doesn't mean that I have to label myself to X, Y, and Z. I just felt like yeah. it today. Eat it. Exactly, exactly. And even when it comes to, you know, before I was always so worried in, in passing as a, as a biological female, um, because I am six foot tall, like I, I'm, a, I'm a tall girl, you know. And, and I, was, I was always scared, for example, of wearing high heels or wearing too much makeup. And now I'm actually the opposite just because I, have, I love this extreme feminine aspect. And when I go out, sometimes I look more, <laughs> more of a drag queen than my drag queen friends, just, but just because I do enjoy that aesthetic of, you know, the massive shoes and, and the massive heels and, and the makeup. And, and I have moved on from that obsession of constantly not having people doubt, you know, if yeah. I was born. You know, and I have moved on into just enjoying myself. And, you know, sometimes that means covering my eyebrows up and doing this kind of alien look, you know, <laughs> sometimes it means well, that's just fashion. That's fashion. And, 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 that's, and, and that's fine. And that's fine. Yeah, exactly. It's how you're supposed to be because otherwise, yeah, it's just, you cannot let it take so much of, of yourself no. with these worries, you know. Yeah, yeah because we don't, we, nobody has time to like, you know, like if we would be constantly worrying about what some, some person thinks of us, you know, we wouldn't be living at all. We would be constantly just altering ourselves to something that we don't even know who we are. And that's completely pointless. If somebody doesn't want to be in your company, doesn't care about, just like pick left or right. I just say it's like, choose, move. I'm not yeah, exactly. um, like it. Like D. Kevin T says, you can be the ripest peach, but you will always meet someone that doesn't like peaches. You know, it's like... Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. Just, that's fine. Just, we, don't have to, we, we all don't have to get along, but we have to be cordial and we have to be respectful. That's the only thing. I always say, like, if you have nothing good to say, shut the fuck up and keep it moving. You know, it's yeah. like, we're not here. It's like, literally, life is not about digging holes underneath others. It's just focus on yourself and do that. Um, on, on that note, since I, I love the fact that you've truly embraced yourself and uh, staying so positive, I wanted to um, uh, raise awareness of, of the fact that we already tapped into and talked on our talk with uh, 100 Showroom about trans rights and what's going on right now. Uh, yeah. Would you like to tell about that, like what is, what is happening here in the UK and how could we all help 
and do our part to make it better. Is there a way? Please tell all of it. Yeah, like sure. it. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a a bad time for for all of this to have to happen because I think it's definitely done on purpose. Of of course. Um, yeah. So the UK has moved to ban uh, trans youth, so trans minors from accessing uh, hormone replacement therapy or gender affirming healthcare. Um, so what that means is that, uh, I mean, this is only, this conversation has only started. There's no laws that have passed, um, you know, uh, making those changes. But I have already seen that uh, the health, uh, uh, the Minister of Women and Equality, she's called uh, Liz uh, Trues. Um, she's the one that this summer is going to try to change uh, the amendment of the Gender Recogni Recognition um, Act of 2004, in which uh, since then is allowed for minors that need it to be able to access testosterone blockers in the case of trans females and then estrogen when they're over 16. Uh, you cannot do it if you're under 16 or less, at least you go to, to a judge and you get involved legally um, with the government. And so it's like it's like a quite difficult thing to do anyway. So people people believe that it's something that minors have easy access to. And it's not the case at all. It's too hard. It's too hard. Even in Spain, I started transitioning when I was 12 years old. It was extremely hard for me to get the hormones. I only got them when I was 16 uh, because I couldn't get them younger because of how the law uh, works. And so I had to wait a long time to access them. But for some reason, uh, this woman and her cabinet believe that uh, trans minors shouldn't have access to these hormones because it is... Um, it is uh, it is a change that you you can, if you do this change it's permanent you cannot go back, but it's because it's puberty it's hormones so that's you know that's what they do and normally you can only start testosterone blockers if you're under sixteen uh, which those are irreversible so what they do is just block your puberty from happening until you're let's say more mature or ready to to go through it and then they give you the estrogen which is like the not reversible part. Um, but this is, well, this is horrific because it would mean, for example, if I was now 10 years old, maybe in two years, uh, when, I, when I need the access to this treatment. And it's not only, it's not only the hormones, it's also the psychological yeah. um, help, um, all, the, all the meetings with the psychologist that are extremely important. Um, there's a lot of minors that are not going to have access to all of this, which could be, to be honest, it would be a really concerning situation because... Like, if I get serious for a minute, I, w I don't think I would have been able to hold until I was 18 to, to get the hormones. And what I mean by that is, like, if you're pushing a minor, a trans minor, to go through the opposite um, physical changes, the opposite puberty that they're supposed to go through, um, that's going to quite possibly end up in a, in a tragedy. Like, yeah. that's going to end up in a tragedy for sure. Like, I'm guaranteeing you that's going to happen. Yeah. Because I, I cry myself to sleep. Oh, for like my the worst time of my life was from 12 years old until 16 years old it was the worst time of my life i went through changes that i wish i hadn't gone through but i just had to and i think i consider myself still lucky that i had access as a minor to hormones and in a way it wasn't as bad as it could have been but i don't wish that in my worst enemy like is is an insane situation yeah. so the fact that this is being considered is blowing me it's blowing my mind and in a way um it is true that there has been a massive, uh, um, a massive increase of uh, minors that are that, uh, get in contact with the NHS to start a hormone treatment. Um, I think, if I don't remember wrong, um, I think in 2005, there was maybe around 30, 40 uh, new cases every year of minors that went to access hormones. Uh, but I think it has moved to 2,500 cases a year now. So that's a massive, that's a massive jump. So that's definitely an aspect that we need to look into that why is that happening? Of course, there's an aspect that right now we're much more aware that this is a reality. Yeah. So when I, started, when I started this whole process, I didn't know that you could transition. <laughs> like no one, no one told yeah, me. Yeah, I've heard you that. Know. Many people say the same. Yeah, that they, you didn't know there was a possibility. And even when, when I had the discussion with my parents when I was 12 years old, that I just went online and researched about it they didn't even have an, a good understanding of it neither. So I feel like in a societal level, the majority of people didn't even know of that reality. 
And if we fast forward back to, to this point right now in which it's completely different because we live in a society that is much more aware and much more supporting of, of trans individuals. Like we, we have actresses that are trans, you know, we have, we have Laverne Cox, for example, it's like such yeah. a big, it's, it's such a change from when I was, from nine years ago when I was 12 years old to now. Um, but of course, I understand there has been this massive increase in cases, but at the same time, I understand this fear that they're getting that maybe there's some people that they're starting this treatment, but it's actually not what it's not right for them because they're using they're using the idea of being trans just because they feel really insecure with their bodies and maybe they're not actually trans and because that's not what they need. But then again, I think it's more about getting the right team of people that can yeah. guide through these th teenagers instead of blocking fully the rest of trans minors to be able to access this yeah, treatment. Because, because the, world, the world is not black and white, because this is the reality yeah. in every, every, every single issue, that it's like there's there's different levels. There are the people who, who think that they might be trans, they might have body dysmorphia, but then there are the people who know exactly what they are. And I don't, I don't think it's, I wouldn't want to be put through, or anybody that I know to be put through that, oh, you, you feel that you are something and now you have to do exactly the opposite. I, I would feel like that is actually torture of the worst really kind. Really, 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 yeah. You really, know, it really, and, it's, and, and it's a crucial point. Yeah, it's and, a the crucial is, point. and the fact is that if somebody willingly is uh, wanting to put someone to go through that because of their beliefs, I think you are the one who needs to get your head checked because I don't, I, I don't, there's a lot of people I don't care about, a lot of things, and you know, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but I still don't wish them ill, ill, Ill ways or want anything bad for them. So I don't, I just don't understand. To me, um, yeah. the, the whole concept is this kind of like, I look at it like this, it's like, you need to get your head checked and you need to get your head checked. Maybe put the, the focus on how can we make the system better so we can identify the right cases yeah. from the wrong cases rather than yeah. no this is just done i feel like we're yeah. going at humans just going backwards, yeah. backwards, backwards. Yeah. and as i said people think there's a really easy pro easy process but it's not at all i had for example as an example you have to do two years of psychological evaluation two years of psychological evaluation to access hormones as a minor like I did that, so it's not easy at all. People think it's, yeah, it's, it's just an easy tramet, but it's not at all. And that said, uh, that said, I think it's such an evil intention to make such a big announcement in a period in which we cannot protest and we cannot, you know, take into the streets and, and create a massive protest in front, in front of parliament. Um, I'm, part of, I'm, I'm in good contact with a group called uh, We Are Transmissions. Um, that is a is a trans uh, is a trans uh, group that I got in contact with three years ago. We have done quite a few protests, and we were trying, we were planning to do a protest, but we were so scared of you know the repercussions of getting you know be because what can you do in a moment like this that is prohibited to to get in such a big group you know because of social distancing and the situation that we're going through the lockdown, and I think it's such an evil moment to, to expose us all to, to this information right now because there's nothing that we can do, but you know, we can plan. take they're it. Doing, they're doing it because that's the Exactly. And I think it's not only happening in the UK, it's happening, to be honest, all over the world. Like, the Trump administ administration uh, now has allowed doctors to uh, not to refuse treatment to trans, uh, to trans patients just because, you know, the freedom of speech and, you know, uh, for example, in Spain, uh, the other day, th there was this video of the police attacking a trans sex worker uh, in the middle of the lockdown as well, and, you know, and insulting her. And it's just like, uh, in Hungary as well, they're trying to, to end the legal uh, recognition recognition of trans people. So legally, they, they will not be recognized as a, as a group, as a minority, which this means that they will not be able to get their name and their sex changed in their ID. So this is all has been happening in, f in three months. And it's happening in all these different, um, in all these different countries. And it's a really scary how now that we're in this situation that we're all recluding and we're all closed uh, behind, you know, closed doors, we're getting all these sneaky 
you know, sneaky tweaks to 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 legislations and to new laws, and and you know, the government is trying to do all these small movements that maybe people are not going to notice because we're going through this massive pandemic and there's more important things to worry about, right? And yeah, so we need to stay we need to stay alert for sure, for sure. Yeah, and and, and uh, the the thing that always infuriates me the most in in situations like this, like whether whether it's about the the subject matter of uh, transsexuals or uh, gay people, like like yeah. how the now how like uh, it's now just open information that they still have gay conversion therapy here, which is which was supposed to be like completely like shut down and still hasn't shut down in the UK. And I'm just like, how the hell is, it's almost like the sort of thing is like, oh, I'm going to brainwash you not thinking that you want to have children one day. It's pretty much yeah. the same thing. It's like, you are what you are. And the most sick part of this, especially like you said that that there's a trans woman who's a sex worker who who is the biggest client of that trans woman sex worker is the heter heteronormative uh basic as majority of people who go want to go and exploit and use their services because they they love it but then when it's the time to say like, okay you did that no it's her fault yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's the thing that, 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 happens a lot. that happens a lot when you're a trans woman. The people that love you are the same people that then when he, that then they're too ashamed to admit it. And that's a massive discussion that is also being had in the community. How there's so many straight men that pursue us, but then they're so scared to admit it. And, you know, and I mean, I have experienced it many, many times. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine. But it's, it's the same. It's, it, it ha even happens to smaller communities with the gay people. Like, they're straight. You know, there's the, the, there's the, the goddamn guy from the football team who likes to, you know, get kiki with the guys. But then it's like, yeah, but I'm doing this. And it's just, it all boils down to insecurities. Who does yeah. it? Who cares? If you want to love this or that person, Go for it, be proud of it, and the more you own it, the more the people around you will own it. You know, absolutely. it's it's just absolutely. like yeah, stupid and infuriating <laughs> to me. Is this kind of kind of like what you do understand? It's so simple. It's like just let it be. If you're not into yeah. it, you're not into and it. And that's visibility. And that's what we visibility, and that's why I do you know things like this, and and we we do all this small projects and all these protests because at the end of the day it's all about getting to know us and getting to understand that yeah that we're just you know that does it this is it we're just regular people yeah and, yeah. and, and, and also, i love the queer community and, from london yeah and to acknowledge the the psychological elements like not just being yeah. like being a teenager it is difficult you know before you even figure out X, Y, and Z, bees and the honey and all of that is difficult. When the the, mm -hmm. the changes in female bodies start changing, when, people, when girls start getting period, that's very scary. I don't know any single woman who, when they first got their period and they start bleeding that, oh, this is normal. <laughs> I think they're freaking out. Just the same way as, as me as a little boy when I start getting my pubic hair and all of that. Or mm -hmm. I, I had a very bad acne and I remember just the acne destroyed me even though i was on medication but just the 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 thing it was just like i call it a thing you have a thing that weighs you down and you just want to get rid of it. that's yeah. how i felt i just wanted to get rid of it and as soon as i got rid of it i felt like my life started <laughs> yeah <laughs> so to speak, it's like that that's simple so guys uh with the time is flow we still have about 13 minutes uh keep on saying the, the questions uh, I have a couple of free questions here already, but now is your time. If you have any any questions that you want to ask, now it's the moment. Keep on sending those in. Um, what do you What do you see uh, as a positive in this whole lockdown as an overall? Do you see any anything any great changes coming to us on this type of social awareness or fashion or stuff like what What do you see as the positives? Um, I think when there's always such a, such a big social change as we're experiencing right now, there's always um, a big, uh, there's always a revolution in some in some degree, in some you know in, in a lot of different elements, in a lot of different scales. Um, so I think that's the the biggest positive is that it gets uh, this 
this breaking point that always allows for creativity and for new ways of thinking to emerge. Like, for example, something that I think is quite interesting is right now, well, I, you know, I work as a, as a fashion designer. I'm trying to launch my brand. And for example, uh, Fashion Week is not happening in July. And it might not even happen for, happening for September. And we're having this massive conversation in the fashion industry of what can we do and where are we going? Are fashion shows, you know, useful? still like I, I, do we have to change that dynamic and that comes to a lot of different levels even in social uh, in a social aspect we're having this massive discussion of is it worth it the life that we were living the speed that we were going the the, the consume the consumerism that we were experiencing you know now we've been closing our house for what two two months and you know it's go, even, even longer depending on the country you've been and we all have been surviving just fine without barely you know, consuming any of these products. I, yeah, so I think it's really interesting because it's letting our, it's slowing the, the, the pace that we were working, all of us were working on, and it's allowing us to think about the type of life that we were carrying and in general as in a, in a social aspect and as a society for sure. So I think that's the most interesting. It always allows for, for thought to be processed, right? Because yeah. we're always going so fast. That is, yeah, I think that's the best part. <laughs> Yeah I, yeah, I totally agree. It's like, and like I, like I would say, like what, what I experienced when I lived in Madrid for a year, you know, it's just like, mañana, you can do it tomorrow. You know, it's not, the world is not going to come to an end if, if you don't uh, constantly proceed onto the next thing, onto the next thing, onto the next thing, because that is a, is a vicious cycle that is very difficult to get out of. And the sort of fear that everything is going to collapse if you don't do X, Y, and Z. And uh, yeah. so... What is uh, an average day uh, of the new normal for you? How has it been? Um, what do you do? How do you get through your day? <laughs> I'm trying to be good in terms of, uh, I, try, I allow myself to sleep a bit. So I wake up at nine in the morning and, you know, have breakfast. It's quite good because my boyfriend is staying with me. So it's a quite nice environment and normally at the moment i'm trying to build my website so i will try to do that in the morning i'll try to do all the computer work in the morning and then we'll go to the park and then come back and maybe in the evening i will try to do less computer so, so more like drawing i have my mind i can see in the back so i try to to work something to work some new patterns out uh, i'm lucky enough that i bought a massive <laughs> a massive pattern cutting roll <laughs> before this whole thing started you know in a way, it's fun because we can play with silhouettes and try to think um, about what to do next. Um, I'm in this spirit right now that I'm interested in doing a new collection for sure. But because of this situation, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think like, how am I supposed to approach it, right? I'm in the research point right now in, in which, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, create a mood that I discovered this new character that I was telling you about. But then again, I'm, I'm trying to think if I want to do a full on collection because of course it's a lot of money and then again, I don't know when it will be shown in because I don't know how long this is going to be. And so it's definitely an interesting point in which I'm trying to figure out how, you know, how I'm going to do all of this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then, well, and then some days, some days we just have dinner with all the flatmates. As I said before, I'm quite lucky to live with, uh, with a gorgeous group of people. I work four in total in the house. So, so, it's, so it's lovely energy, to be honest. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. So you can have like little house parties. What I would say is like, it's very interesting that where you just mentioned about the research, I think for, for what I would advise and consult any, any designers is try to think about things that are uh, seasonless type of things that can transition. Like what, how, how can you incorporate one piece of design into a person's like, uh, Mm -hmm. here so to speak and then work around with that sort of things like how can this piece from summer transition to fall mm -hmm. and, and i think that's that that is a learning to more me, time that's is right a, it's a very in interesting concept because i think mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about like completely ditching the seasons and then rather focusing on on garments as a you know piece of piece of art yeah, sort of work like, yeah it's like yeah uh, enough, yeah for yes, sure. you do like you just introduce like few designs throughout the year, and then that that becomes the collection of that year. For mm -hmm. example, two thousand twenty-one, 
this designer did this. Yeah, they I mean, really used to do that in the in the eighties. I think Mugler yeah, used to. Yeah, and I, I miss that. I miss that. That's the moment, right? So I mean, it's again going back to what we were saying of being able to understand the pace that we were going. That we're definitely that this is a really important discussion to have in the industry. That the pace that we were going before it was a bit pointless, and maybe some people were making a lot of money, but was it? worth it a lot of you know creative talent were getting extremely burned out uh, people weren't lasting in the big houses because you know there's such a big pressure so yeah. it's definitely an, an important concept yeah, yeah it's, it's impossible i mean it's like it's like they say the more money the more problems you have then you you have you get all of your millions and you think that your life is sorted no you're worried about the next 10 million and yeah it's, it's the same thing it's like you know giving your hand like little pinky to the devil and there we go you gotta get sucked in okay we have about five minutes so now we have to go to and do the famous quick fire round so you can answer it's either or questions nothing nothing uh serious you just say this or that whatever whatever you want to answer to that that's uh, up to you there's no rules in that sort of sense so let's go real or faux leather uh real real leather uh bar or house party house party <laughs> yeah <laughs> skirts or trousers skirts for sure mangoes or papayas mango delicious beef or pork neither <laughs> <laughs> but neither. i was like, like the reason why i'm asking you is because i know you're spanish and uh yeah, and i'm just italian as well so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i have to ask that um um wolf or sheep sheep <laughs> actually <laughs> uh jean d'arc or frida kahlo mm, jenna d'arc jenna d'arc uh madrid or barcelona barcelona because i haven't been to madrid yet still <laughs> you've so never been to madrid i've never been to madrid i'm from barcelona and i've never been to madrid i know <laughs> unbelievable you have to go and visit I, I i i was supposed to i moved to barcelona we were there for four days and the catalonia uh crisis hit and we just jumped on the train and went to madrid and then we stayed for a year um <laughs> Yeah, city or the beach. City, always city. Uh, tinto de verano or sangria. Sangria for sure. City. Uh, <laughs> I love, I love tinto de verano. I love it. Uh, pop or rock music. Rock, rock for sure. Madonna or Lady Gaga. Ah, uh, Lady Gaga. I have to admit it. Yeah, same, same, same. <laughs> Sweet, sweet or salty? Salty. Seasonal or non-seasonal? Non-seasonal. That's where we're going, right? Yeah. <laughs> summer, <laughs> or, summer or winter? Summer. Summer. My Spanish blood has to say, yeah, summer. And then the last question. We actually just got the two-minute mark before we cut off. Head or the heart? The heart. Amazing. This concludes the episode 16 of Morse Code by Vesa. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you, and um, so I'm so happy that we got got to cover so much. Yes. And I could have gone easily for another two hours. And yeah, you know, we did. We didn't get uh, going too far. Is there is there any uh, last shout outs for people who fell in love with you as much as I did during this conversation, where they can follow you, stalk you, see what you're doing, have yeah. about minute 20 seconds before we cut off. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me in Alexandra Munoz. There I post all my work and and my thoughts and uh, in the bio you have a link if you want to message me uh, to my personal email regarding, you know, making you some garments <laughs> some, or whatever it is for sure. Um yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh obviously everybody knows you can't go now on the 24 hour Insta live uh rechecking back. Don't worry. This episode will be saved and will be with you in IGTV very, very soon. I wish you a great evening and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.